Welcome back to Books to Die For. This is brought to you by the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. So today we've got a uh, House of Mystery co-host, and, we, and he writes uh, thriller spy books. And he's got a new book out now called The Burning Spy, and it's Spies for Hire, book two, Gavin Stone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So listen, Gavin, Burning Spy. So what's, what's this story all about? What do you got going on here in this book? So this is uh, the middle of a trilogy, and book one was really, really popular. People loved it. This is kind of um, giving you the next part of the story, uh, and it's kind of, uh, how can I put it? It's it's a massive journey for the characters involved, as well as uh, not just not just a physical journey, but like a character journey as well. So we've got, we've got this mission of of the the main protagonist jensen who is going to be fighting an unknown enemy as he goes being a, a series like this did you have this kind of mapped out ahead of time and you just kind of get the details out like because you know you know where you're going with this series loosely yeah i had a i had a, a like concept when i first started and what i did is, is i wrote book one um so it could be read as a standalone if need be and I thought to myself, if it, if it's popular and people like it and, and the demand's there, then I'll carry on with book two and three. And if not, then at least I can say, well, it, it was a good book and I'll give it a shot. Um, so, yeah, I did kind of loosely have uh, all three parts because originally it was going to be a trilogy anyway. Um, and although it has taken a couple of rapid changes before I actually uh, hit the go button on number two. So Spies for Hire, what is that in the series? Like, what, what's that about? Well, what, what I've done is I've strayed away from the traditional kind of glossy exterior that Hollywood portrays as a spy, this kind of, you know, perfect Mr. and Mrs. Smith or James Bond kind of characters. And I've gone more down a realistic route with it. And what a lot of people don't realize is about 70% or more of the intelligence community is actually made up of contractors and private uh, hired help. Um, so I've kind of mixed in the, the realism of, of what the... the that view would have to do, or what, what that perspective would be from a contractor's point of view, what we have to do in the world of uh, of intelligence, because it's very often overlooked. It, it seems to be the, the, the general public tend to think that you're either working for the government or you're not, and they don't realise that there's actually this private area that do a lot of work on behalf of the government, and that's kind of what I've spent a lot of my life doing and kind of put it into the book. To, to, to kind of say, look, this, this is a little bit of an area that most people don't talk about. Now, your main spy, like, uh, the, the, the character, I guess I would say, is uh, the British guy. His name's Jensen. So who is Jensen? Like, where do you, where do you get that inspiration for? Um, I would like to say he's loosely based on myself. However, if if I could, if I could be a, a, a percent of how good Jensen is, then I'd be happy. He's kind of, he's me on my really, really, really best day, uh, where everything goes right and and everything works out well. That that would be kind of um, the the version when the, when the story was first written. It was uh, I started going down an autobiographical route, and I wanted to kind of tell a little bit of the, a story of the things that I had done in my career. Um, and in the end, there was that many complications and problems and, and potential issues that would have been caused from the book being released that I decided to write a, a fiction story as well, based on kind of my experiences and things I've done it in the field. Now, do you, are you telling it from Jensen's point of view, or do you do it from another person? Overall, it's kind of third-person omniscient, so it's, it, it's mostly from Jensen's point of view, um, but there are other chapters or, or other bits of pieces where it, it does kind of change from the, to the other um, characters, which are Mar Marshall and Darius. How do you do that, like, without confusing your readers? Is there a certain way you present, let's say, when Marshall's coming in to talk from his point of view? Um, how do you do that? Yeah, it's, it's something that was very difficult, uh, and I learned by mistake. When I was first having writing lessons, I'd, I'd kind of already written a lot of this out, um, and I did master classes with the likes of Dan Brown and, and, and a few other great people who've helped me along the way. And I realized that what I'd done was this omniscient point of view instead of being through the eyes of a single character. Um, so what I, what I did is, is I would actually write it in. So you'd have Jensen in a particular room and I'd write it from his point of view. And then I'd say, you know, he didn't realize that back down in the street, Darius was doing X and then it got to Darius's point of view and, 
uh, you know, a bit, a bit like the kind of meanwhile back at the ranch kind of line uh, here and there to kind of shift the perspective. And and how do you keep the the action moving along, or do you like was there a certain way that you you make it so that there's always something going on in a chapter? Or? Yeah, because when they kind of get um, handed this primary mission, as it were, the first thing they have to do is get to England. And from the minute they land in England, they're, they're covering their tracks and things are starting to go wrong, left, right and centre. They don't understand how people are always kind of seeming to be ahead of them in, in, in what they're trying to do or, or keep c- catching them or coming close to catching them. So they're kind of on the run um, and not understanding why they're even being chased or, or, or who by. Um, so it, it's, it's every kind of step of the way they get to another bit, they get across into Europe and then they nearly get caught again and it just goes on until, until like towards the end when they, they kind of start to understand, ah, we, now we know why, uh, we, we're, we're kind of, we're behind the curve with everything, um, which gives them a slight advantage just having a little bit of knowledge but they've still got the odds kind of stacked against them physically. How do you write the violence? Is it is it is it is there a lot of violence? Are you are you are you very open about how you write violence, or do you are you a little bit more conservative? Yeah, no. It's, I mean, some of it's from from experience. So I, I mean, yeah, I grew up in a great big city in in central England, which um, I'm not going to go too deep into details, but it's it can be. A little bit of a, a hostile place at times. So, um, you know, all through kind of school, you know, the school I went to, if you had teeth, they called you a wimp. So, um, we, we were, <laughs> we were kind of, uh, it was, it was a very fight, fighting, fight for your life environment in some instances. Um, and then, you know, that obviously that kind of went on later on with, with training. So these days, what I tend to do is, um, uh, I go out and get myself into a bar fight, and then just go back and write what happened. Oh, no, I'm, I, I'm only joking. <laughs> no, I, 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 I don't. I don't. The, the rest of it's true, but the bar fight bit isn't. <laughs> oh, please, come on! I know you do it. Yeah, you got to get the <laughs> acting out. You know how you get into the violence and stuff. How, how graphic do you get? I, I like to get it as um, as detailed as as I can to to kind of. I want the the uh, audience to be able to feel everything that's going on. Um, even if, even if they're feeling it from the person who's committing the violence, you know, they're kind of um, understanding what the the other person is going through, you know, in their mind because they're they're kind of fighting for their lives. And I don't mind getting graphic with it at all. Um, it's something that I'm I'm not scared of it. And 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 sometimes I've, I've watched people reading my books and I can see them flapping and screaming, you know, <laughs> uh, which is is great because it, it shows that I'm doing a a good enough job for them to kind of uh, be picturing it in their mind. What do you What do you hope the reader takes away from the story? Then, what do you? Is it entertainment? Do you want them to think about something, or is it? What do you want? So mostly entertainment. Um, you know, that, that's that's what you know the readers are picking a book up for at the end of the day. They they want something that's going to kind of keep them interested. So uh, I've got all the all the kind of the, the good stuff in there. You know. Uh, in comparison to the last book, you know, there's more explosions, more humour, more tradecraft. Um, but you've also got all the, the nice little juicy secrets that are in there. Um, in fact, I had to, um, I, I had to read that a, a particular part out because what I did is I, I, I put the number for the, the uh, CIA station chief in Prague uh, in the book. Um, and when I went back to check, it was actually still the active number for the CIA station chief in, in Prague. And I, oh, oh dear. Uh, so I've had to read that, that uh, and one or two other little bits. Um, you yeah, know, maybe when the numbers changed, I might give it a, a, an unredacted version. Um, but yeah, so the, 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 there's lots of tradecraft in the book. Um, there's lots of little secrets that are in the book that people might not know about and uh, techniques that, that they can learn along the way. So that side of it keeps it interesting as well as the story um, and obviously shows the, the world from, like I said, a very unusual perspective of, of a contractor more so than a government worker, which in the intelligence community, contractors are, are, are pretty much looked down upon um, but you know they they do have to do some really hairy, horrible work from time to time. Right. So, do you think that it's portrayed typically um, in in movies and and books or shows or in media? Period. How the agency works or how spies are or contractors, as you say, do you think that's portrayed properly for people? Parts of it are yes. Um, I mean, obviously, depending on on what you're watching, um, but. I mean, obviously, the, the, 
there's, there's a, a lot of moving parts in any intelligence agency, uh, and obviously the the layer of deniability is is has to be for certain jobs has to be in place. So you might have the seventh floor at Langley, for example, who'll turn around and say to you know one of one of the, the station chiefs, we need this particular job or we need this particular information. Then that station chief may look at hiring somebody off the books who will go out and find out that particular information who have nothing to do with the CIA. Um, and, and this is the kind of thing that MI6 and all the intelligence agencies do. They'll hire surveillance operatives, even Mossad, um, to go out and find particular information or do particular tasks and then come back and, and kind of give the information. So some do. Um, I think, is it Jack Ryan? I think some of the little bits and pieces in that are, are pretty close from time to time. I mean, obviously, again, there's poetic license because it's for um, entertainment purposes. But, yeah, um, the, I think the, the, the biggest kind of trope of all is, is that spies are kind of perfect in every way. You know, can fight 100 people in a room and then walk out and kind of not a hair out of place and then drink a sip of martini. Well, it's not that way. No, 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 we don't drink martini. <laughs> oh. Oh. No, what, do, you, do you have to be careful then about what you do put in the book? Uh, so, yeah, I've, I've got a kind of um, the moral code, as it were, if you want, with the likes of the, the stuff that I put in the book. Um, so unlike uh, some of the other CIA guys and MI6 guys and, and people who have to uh, go through a pre-publication review, I don't have to. Because of the fact that I can, because I was a contractor, I, I wasn't subject to the same rules and laws. I am still subject to the Official Secrets Act, though. And what that means is I can talk about things I've done, I can talk about training I've had, I can talk about fictional kind of um, situations, but I can't give away information on if there's a particular person at, at this particular house as a defector from X country, uh, and, and that would then put that person in danger or. Jobs that I've done, for example, where it could then be tra tracked back to the person or, or organisation or people behind it. So it, it, it's, uh, I'm sounding very nebulous while I'm talking about this, which is, which is uh, sorry, I'm trying trying not to be. I'm trying to be specifically nebulous. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, that sounds like a good title for a book, doesn't it? That's specifically nebulous. Yeah, that'll be book, th book four. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, uh, but, but at the same time, the, the kind of, what I do is if I'm not going to put anybody's life in danger, and then the only other thing that I've said I won't put in a book is how to make explosives. There's loads of other things in there, but the explosives, I think, uh, uh, there's no reason why anyone would need the exact recipe uh, you know, for, for that. There, there is an exception in, in the first draft of Part 3, however, where I do kind of give, loosely give the details on how to make an improvised atom bomb. Um, but uh, not in <laughs> not enough detail, I don't think, for anybody to actually try and recreate one. Well, what's your favourite spy um, to watch or to to read? Or is there? Do you have a favourite spy besides your own, of course, Ooh. that you think um, hits home or or you like for whatever reason? Yeah, I kind of. Um, so our friend from MI6, Charles Beaumont, who we interviewed not so long back, um, I, his, his book was really good because it was kind of, it, it shows that when you've left MI6 and you're out, you're kind of, you, you're, it, it, it's difficult to to get on. And when you become this middle-aged spy and you get this thing called, um, and this is like a, a agency or, or intelligence agency parlance, it's called Seeing Ghosts. And it's it's when you you think you're being followed and you're not because you've had that many years of of checking your mirrors and that kind of thing you start to see ghosts. Um, so it kind of gives that kind of um, frame of mind. But obviously in in the book it, it turns out he was actually under surveillance. So he's he's one of my favourites. Um, well, what do you get out of writing a book? Like how how does it make you feel? Ah, uh, it's good for me. It's, it's, it was therapeutic when I first started because if you can imagine working in an industry, so unlike the military who have parades and medals and, and kind of, you know, a, a lot of things like that, anybody working in the intelligence industry generally, they can't tell anybody. They have to keep a lot of secrets. It's, it's, they're not very open with what they do or where they've been and that kind of thing. So to put it all down on paper to start with was, was, therapeutic in the sense of, ah, I'm letting something out here, it's a form of release. So it was great for me to be able to do that. Um, and and that allowed me also to kind of have an outlet for uh, people to be able to know some of the things I've done without actually knowing the details of them. So it was enjoyable. 
I noticed, you know, and it happens all the time, but, you know, agencies like the CIA and different ones, spy agencies quite often will come into the spotlight and be under attack or be kind of talked about negatively and stuff. What what do you think about that stuff? Is that is that reliable? Like you know, for instance, the terror attack in Moscow, and they said the CIA did it. You know, or there's stuff like that, and and quite a few people believe it. It's not just just you know Uncle Joe down the road. It's you see thousands of people kind of getting into that sort of thing, saying, oh yeah, and they're they're corrupting everything. They they run everything. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. Do they are people really that out of touch, or or is it really kind of true? They do have a lot of involvement. They, I mean, they do have a lot of influence, but I think the likes of the CIA is everybody's big bad at the moment in the world full of conspiracy theorists. And the moment something goes wrong or they don't like something, it's really easy because they're scared of what they don't know. Uh, and they don't know what exactly, I mean, they've got an idea, but they don't know exactly what the CIA does, so therefore, um, they kind of, you know, it's, it's easy to point the finger at the target and say, you know, yeah, the CIA did that. And of course, the CIA are not the kind of organization to be on the news every five minutes saying, no, we didn't. And what, what really doesn't help them is when you look at the history of what the intelligence agency has done, in the past, and, and you, you know, you had through the kind of 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, they were, they were testing different uh, drugs and mind control options and, uh, on, on people. Um, this got leaked out, which they obviously denied, and then declassified the files a few years later, saying that they actually were doing it all the time. Um, and then from that, you got all the I told you so's, um, and what that seemed to do then was kind of rubber stamp any conspiracy theory for anybody else then, you know, it's like anything at all, you know, oh, the CIA killed all the dodos, you know, the CIA, uh, you know, kind of uh, shooting stars out the sky or whatever whatever crazy it is uh, this week. And, and people are kind of buying it because one thing from the 70s got confirmed. Yeah, I guess it's one of those... Um... One of those weird things that it'll, it'll never go away because people will never really know what's behind mm -hmm. the door in the CIA, right? They just see they see things on TV and they just think, "Wow, yeah, it's yeah. crazy," you know. So, um, well, that's 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 cool. So, what's the hardest part of writing a book like this? Um, I, for me personally, I, I mean, there are a lot of challenges, but there are parts of the the job that I find personally really interesting but then i'm like well will the reader find that interesting so it's finding that right balance of of what i like and what's going to keep the reader engaged also i'm not confusing anybody with any parlance or terminology so i've put a glossary in the book to kind of help out there um and then probably the, what the most single difficult challenge is keeping a lot of action going on and you know explosions and car chases and that kind of thing um, which generally doesn't actually happen. <laughs> and if it does, then you, you, everything's gone horribly wrong. Um, uh, and at the same time, kind of trying to keep a level of realism. Um, everything in the book has been based on, you know, factual events, factual places, uh, things I've actually experienced and done firsthand and, and kind of, um, you know, if I mention a website in the book, that website's real. If I mention a, uh, you know, a code to a door in the book, that the code is the door. You know, the, the code is to that door. Um, so I've kept everything continuity-wise as real as I possibly can. But then obviously, you know, like I say, the, the, the usual explosions and car chases kind of thing are not something that generally happens. If, if you're doing that, then you've, you've, you've gone horribly wrong. And they, so you go out there and, and chase people around to see how they react? or Yeah, occasionally I have to dress up to do that, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, put on a put on a mask and just That's you know, it's, oh, uh, yeah, strange chicken man. suit or something like that. You know, anything just to uh, you know, kind of <laughs> see the different reactions. A chicken. So, what's your relationship with Jensen? How do you how do you how do you write that character? Who who is he? Um, he's kind of the the best version of me that if if I could ever be somebody, he's who I'd like to be. Uh, you know, his level of skill and intelligence. Um, so what I do is when I write this character and I write him into a situation and then I'll turn around and say, right, what would I do if I could do anything? If I was really great and I, you know, I had these abilities or, or whatever, um, you know, or I was much better at certain things, 
you know, how would I deal with this situation? And that's where I tend to approach it from. And of course, I don't always have things going right because that would be boring. You know, you, you do have to have, sometimes you, you can't achieve certain things one way. So you have to come up with alternatives and, and be dynamic with it. Yeah. It must be, it must be quite the process uh, to go through. What's, what's your favorite thing about writing? Um, I, I think I, I love, I love to hear back from people when they've read the book and they tell me, you know, I mean, it's nice to know they've enjoyed it, but if there's one particular part where they say, I really laughed at this bit, you know, I've tried to keep as, you know, a good amount of humour in the books because in the real world, this is a lot of the time how we deal with situations, especially when it's a, a really bad situation, it's the humour that gets you through. So I've tried to keep that side of it, the banter between the characters and the humour uh, going. So I've had a, a few people contact me saying, you know, I've, I've spit my coffee out several times, you know, in your book, so you owe me 20 Starbucks by now because, uh, you know, I've spat that much coffee out laughing at some of the humour, which, which that, that kind of really cheers me up. And that's got to be um, kind of, I'd imagine that's one of the, the hardest things to do is to get the humor right or get it correct for these times because nowadays things are pretty, uh, you have to be careful on how you word things, you know, and what you're laughing at because people get upset nowadays pretty easily. Yeah, we, we are living in a world which is becoming ever increasingly delicate and what I've done is I've kind of really pushed the boundaries there a little bit because... Um, I thought to myself, if it, if it gets some press, uh, you know, and somebody can, makes a complaint, <laughs> then it'll, it'll certainly help me. You know, what is it they're saying? Or any news, any news is good news. That's the one. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. You know, but, um, it's same as you, you know, you're writing about espionage and, and, and spies and agencies and going around countries and killing and stuff like that and all the things going on in a spy book. I guess, do you pay attention to what's going on in the world, in the world of spies today and the world of espionage, and, and do you try to stay away from it or do you try to duplicate it? Uh, I've still got a lot, of, a lot of friends in the intelligence community and in the military, so, I, you know, I am kind of updated a lot with what's going on. Um, and I love to see the three different versions of, of what's happening in the world because I get one version from friends in the know, and then I get another version which is on the news, uh, uh, you know, kind of, you know, the, the 10 o'clock news telling you the, uh, the the version that they want the public to know. And then I get the internet version, uh, which can be absolutely crazy or, or scarily close to the truth. And, uh, and and the three kind of, they overlap like a, a very clever Venn diagram, Venn diagram. You know, it's uh, it's quite impressive. Well, which do you go with? I mean, I mean, are you, you know what I mean? Like, do you, um, or do you stay away from that sort of stuff? No, not at all. I mean, I, I've, I've actually had, um, a lot of time and a, a lot of kind of, uh, Possibly, you could call it training, to be able to look at, uh, at certain information analytically, especially when it comes to, to you know, mainstream media, and be able to um, dissect it and say, well, look, is, is, this, is this headline information or is it an emotional trigger? Is this article based on fact or is it based on somebody's opinion? And, and to look deeper into, you know, the sources and, and you know, even, even down to things like a survey, for example, which is trying to sway your opinion, uh, you can look at it and say, well, hang on, when and where was the survey taken and amongst who? And all these different kind of factors can, can change entirely the results of a survey and uh, make a, an article that seems impartial very, very biased. So luckily I've had the, the kind of, um, like I say, training, as it were, to be able to look at things and, and, and take them apart and find out when you get down to the meat and bones of it, is there actually any information there or is this just something to sway opinion? Do you ever, do you ever uh, write something and you're doing some writing in a book like a story or something and, uh, and then something happens in the world that makes it so that it wouldn't work and you just scrap it? No, yeah, so I had something very, very similar in, in the first one, because um, I was writing this, the, the whole trilogy was written a long, long time ago, and it took me a long time to get it all right. Um, so when I wrote the first one, there's a, uh, uh, a line in it where they're, they're talking about Prince the singer, um, and they mention the fact that, you know, they're, they're going to, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to go to take him to a Prince concert or something along those lines. And, um, and then Prince went and inconsiderately died. 
um, which was rather annoying, <laughs> you know, probably a little bit more for him than me, <laughs> admittedly. Um, but yeah, it really kind of uh, messed things up because I thought, well, what do I do now? Do I le- do I leave it in, or or do I have to change it? And it was so awkward to change it, and uh, in the end, I just, I just left it. And I thought I'll let people work the timeline out for themselves. Yeah, you know, people are rude. Like O.J. Simpson die on a weekend. Oh, I know. I mean, you know, wreck your weekend. How rude! Exactly. <laughs> he could. He could have had some consideration. He could have waited. Well. Waited till a Monday morning yeah. at least. Yeah. Yeah. My God. You know, you can't win. Well, listen. So, um, how do people get a hold of you? Um, do you have website? Do you have social media? What's what's the get to get to gather? Okay, so the uh, if you want to follow what I'm doing writing wise, then all the usual social media sites. Uh, Twitter is um, uh, I think it's at, at author Gavin. Um, I'm on LinkedIn for the kind of business things. Facebook is where I tend to stick most of my posts, which is just Gavin Stone author. Um, I have finally broken and and set up a TikTok account, but. I, I'm, I'm st- still working on on. Ha- I'm still trying to figure out how exactly that works, uh, and I, I am on Instagram as well, but I, I don't use that one as much. Right? Did you do a website then, or? Yeah, which keeps changing because the guy who keeps messing with my SEO kind of stuff um, keeps giving it a different name. So it started off as one thing, and I think at the moment it's Gavin Stone Author dot net i think <laughs> <laughs> well there you go we, we hear it all here right from from the, the man himself so now the book the burning spy is spies for hire book two is out now people get it don't miss it and the author's gavin stone thank you for being on the show gavin thank you for having me it's been wonderful